Hello everyone and welcome to this fantastic Privacy Kitchen session. I'm, I'm really delighted to be joined by Tash Whitaker and David Clark and um, we'll do introductions in just one second. So um, this is a Privacy Kitchen session on data maps which is really the cornerstone, the foundation of your privacy governance so it's a really key thing. We're looking at what is and what isn't your data map, we're looking at the impacts of Brexit, the gift that keeps giving, um, we've got some great war stories or we've got some great practical advice. So um, straight into some introductions, we've got a lot to talk about. So uh, I'm Robert Bohr, I'm the founder and CEO of Keepable. We're privacy management SaaS and a policy pack giving you a framework for GDPR and PECA. Um, well, that's enough about me. So, so uh, Tash, do you want to introduce yourself and, and, and your business? Sure, I'm Tash Whitaker. I run Whitaker Solutions Limited. Um, we do consultancy to businesses on anything data related, to be honest, whether that be ISO, gap analysis, um, data management, data quality, TQM, but most of the work that we do is related to data protection and we offer data, data protection officer as a service to a number of clients as well. Fantastic, fantastic. And, and David, would you do the same please? Right, yeah, David Clark. Um, yeah, I've got a background in uh, cyber and data protection, um, all sizes of companies. Um, I kind of figured um, GDPR was going to kick off in 2014. I think I was kind of two years too early, um, but it's, it's definitely come of age now. And yeah, I, I kind of work with companies on uh, cyber and data protection. Uh, it's fantastic to have you both. Thank you very much for being guest chefs. And I do apologize for not having sent you your Privacy Kitchen mug in <laughs> advance, but uh, I know, David, you got your GDPR one there. So um, straight into the questions then. We've got, so, ah, fantastic, a geographic. We can get into that one as well. That's a fantastic segue <laughs> for later on as well. So uh, just diving straight into the first questions then. So um, David, could I ask you to, inter in to introduce what a data map is and we can talk about what the title of it is, be it, I mean, we've just been talking about that before this call, it'd be great to yeah, talk about that as well. Yeah, um, I think that's kind of a good question, and, and, and I think to some extent it depends on who you're talking to, because uh, quite often to kind of have a full data map, you, you may need a number of journeys that all run in parallel. You may need the technical journey, the privacy journey, the data journey, where it physically goes, the business journey, kind of what we're using it for, the security journey, you know, number of companies, when you start mapping out the security journey, you'll find, you know, easily 10, 12 different security domains, which kind of means, what do you do if there's a breach? What do you do if there's a problem? Actually, you don't really know who to call, what to do. Um, often that will need an overlay of a kind of visual descriptive, so it's sort of understandable, and actually kind of what your outcome is. So it, it, it kind of really does depend on the context and, and who you're doing it for. Um, it all around the GDPR sort of e-privacy because it's not just GDPR is it it's on a privacy data map so when I use sort of data map in this sense I'm thinking about the privacy governance uh, personal data inventory uh, and yeah. so we were talking about this so, so uh, Tash I was going to ask how is that different to say an asset register in common parlance or a security yeah. asset register so asset register, I tend to think of your asset register being a little bit like a map of the street. It is the types of buildings that you have, um, how they are secured, what they contain or what they should contain, what their address is, that sort of thing. The record of processing is what's actually happening inside. So if you think of it as a party invite, the party invite is your asset register, that's all the facts. And the record of processing is what goes on Facebook, is what actually happens <laughs> in the real world. Now your data map to me is way bigger than all of that. Data map can be a very overwhelming term because it can be absolutely everything. It's your asset register, it's your record of processing for Article 30, it's your um, security, it's everything. And it is very, very overwhelming. So I prefer to think of it first as, you know, start off with one and then build it up. And over time, you will have a holistic view of your data. And that's what you can call a data map. But it's yeah. not a quick job to do. And it's not the first way of doing it, I don't feel. That's interesting. What do you think the first way of doing it is? Just start with one or the other. A lot of companies will have started with their asset register yeah. because they did ISO 27001 before they started thinking about privacy. Um, so for some, that's their first step for at least knowing what assets they have, what databases they have, what filing cabinets they have, whose drawers they've got and so on. You know, 
Others will have started with just the basic um, GDPR record processing. Um, you know, the ICO have done a nice template that you can follow for these particular data elements. They go slightly beyond what's in the regulations. Um, but if you start with what's in the regulations are the things that you need to track about the data that you're processing. So what are you processing? Why? What's your lawful basis? Where is it stored? Which then links into your asset register if you've got one. You know, who you're transferring it to. It's the it's the business side of what are you doing with your data? You don't need to be technical to be able to answer those questions. So for yeah, some, we yeah. start with the asset register. For others, we start with the, the basic, you know, process mapping. I think so. So before um, founding Keepable, I was uh, general counsel of startups and building sort of doing the, the, the sort of the role of cu our respective customers now. And, and then I was a consultant when I was doing the hypothesizing around Keepable. And one of the bits on the, the data mapping exercise, and I think it's really interesting this conversation, you know, what does that actually mean as a term? So I went to one client and they said, well, we've done our data map and it was there, as you say, the 27,000 one, the security one. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if there were 27,000, but they've done a security asset register and they said, we know where all our data is. And then that's like, like you say, I love the analogy of the, the, the street block and the buildings and everything. I said, great. So what's actually, how do you process it? What do you process it for? What about recruiting? And they were like, oh, uh, no, we know there's a server and we've, we've secured it. I said, yes, but what's that data used for? And, and so I think the, the way I look at it is, um, I totally agree a data map can be a, a very broad term and it, it can be a huge a huge area with i like the way that you sub you've both talked about the subsets of it i think the security map tends to me to be driven by the, the the requirement to find your security assets your information assets secure them secure them more if it's sensitive data and the risks to the enterprise and then for gdpr you've got the um what goes on facebook so it's what happens with all that data um, the risks to the individual, GDPR doesn't care about your enterprise, it cares about that individual. So often I, we, we start in Keepable with the activities. So, um, you know, HR recruiting, finance, payroll, and that might hit different assets or different locations and what have you. And as, as you said, David, you walk it through. I think that's a really, that's a really key thing. Could you actually, on, so David, on that bit where you're talking about building that map and having all those different strands, when you have those conversations, you're walking it through from a from a privacy privacy point of view. What are the some of the sort of top tips on and the typical errors on that part of it of saying of focusing in? You might say go to marketing, say I know you do this, or do you just send marketing a questionnaire? Um, I've got to say I've never found questionnaires really work that well. Um, they sound really good idea, but people kind of tend to reply with what they think you want to hear, or yep. I, I've never really found that work. So. Generally, it, it, it kind of works better by at least starting point is by interview and then you need to verify what's going on after face to face because otherwise all you're doing is having a discussion. There's no real evidence there. And quite often, most businesses are way more complex than, you know, a kind of normal record of processing can manage in a data map. You know, if you've kind of got the, the Ofcom advertising awareness for, you know, age appropriate design and so on so suddenly your your data might be okay your security might be all right but your messaging might be wrong as well so you've suddenly got to build that layer into it as well because now you're dealing with under 18s under 16s etc etc and, and putting all that together and then making it make sense and then getting the client to understand it uh, are some are some of the kind of challenges really that you know there's an awful lot involved that you know i guess no one really worried about to you know till recently that's a fantastic point i, think I was talking to um a consultant yesterday and it was around you know when you go into a business there's not necessarily the business doesn't necessarily have a view of that complexity um you know they've been dealing with it sometimes to a more or less superficial level but, um, um but often the gdpr when you guys go in and you're talking to your customers this is often the first time they've really brought it together it's one of those aspects a benefit of doing a gdpr uh, and we say gdpr but it's the privacy um program do you see that as a big benefit when you talk to the clients and, and what other sort of benefits do you see there? I see definitely. So when I go in, I always start by just having conversations. I show them the Excel sheet that I'm potentially filling in. And after about five minutes, I just throw it away. It's like, you know, roughly what I'm going to be asking, you know, yeah. but let's just talk. And I, I warn them, I'm going to ask you some really irritating questions. You're not going to like them because I'm going to be, why? What exactly are you doing? So you're not using it the way you just said you were, are you? You're actually doing this with it, aren't you? 
I said, it can be really annoying because I've got to get down to exactly what you're doing because only then can I work out how this fits into a record of processing. My next step after that is to write it up in a Word document. I don't go near the spreadsheet yet. I say, this is what you told me about what you do written in plain English, yeah. is this right? And from that, I will then retrofit it into a record of processing. And that's where I notice I've got gaps. And then I go back to them with almost a completed one and say, I've got a gap here, what do you do? Can you check this and fill it in? And that way I avoid questionnaires because I'll never get the answer I want from a questionnaire. But also they're sort of bought into it because they've read it as a story. It's like, yeah, that is what we do. Or no, you've missed this. Actually, we do that. You know, so yeah. it's a, a multiple step process. And I'm quite glad as well there's been clarity around the fact that the DPO is really supposed to do the record of processing because that wasn't defined originally um but in all the guidance since they've suggested that that is a role that the dpo should do because it's the only way you fully understand the business you know when someone yeah. starts saying it's like mm -hmm. i'm using this to do that you're like whoa 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 whoa, that's not in your record of processing back we go <laughs> yeah 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 Have you, and, the, and whether there's an assessment needed and all these sort of gaps as well so it's and one of the things i think with the you both said about the 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 questionnaires and the surveys, sending them out. I had there was a great one. Uh, someone said, if you ask somebody and you send a pro, you send a questionnaire to say someone in marketing, say, do you process personal data? No. So they like, you know, they won't go any further. But also, we were talking just earlier about even, you know, and this is no, there's no judgment here at all. It's like, you know, I don't know that much about about sort of the technical aspects of of a, of a system. I'm sort of on the uh, sort of legal and compliance side, but. So I'm not expecting people to know that much about my area either. So some, you know, very skilled security people, IT people, marketing people, HR people, you know, they're very skilled in their areas. There's no reason they're going to know what a processor is or a controller is under GDPR, which is, you know, you can't sort of reduce these questions down to, to plain English too much. You've still got to use some jargon. Do you find that as one of the aspects? And it also depends on the context because they can be both in certain circumstances. So depending yeah. on what angle you're looking at, they could be the processor and the controller or, or kind of change role for a, another part of the journey. And, that, and that's, yes. you know, to some extent, some of those concepts do kind of fall apart, especially on big companies, you know, where they've got a huge amount of entities they own and control and one company owns all the employees, the other company kind of owns all the IT assets and, you know, which one's controller, which one's processor, depends on the time of day and what's going on. Mm. Absolutely, and, and that's an interesting. Sorry, just go on, Tash. So you do find yourself asking the questions. You know, are you doing this for yourself, or are you doing it because they told you to? You know, and that's the, sort of the, the leading question to try and get to. Are you actually the processor in this, or are you the controller? Do you get any benefit from doing this other than you know pe you get paid to do it? You know, it's, yeah. it's quite an interesting one. You start really delving in. And um, and then discovering that yeah, they're the processor, but they're also doing stuff with the data they shouldn't be doing, and then you're like, oh god. <laughs> yeah, we start off doing it for someone else, and then we go, no, stop, stop, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and so, th what's in, what's also come out here is that we, so we've talked about, for example, twenty seven thousand and one, and and uh, we did some research at Keeper, which is on Keeper, which it's on our website that. Um, the actual adoption rate of 27,001 is tiny. It's amazingly tiny. So I was actually, I've got a non-alcoholic beer during lockdown and I, I was looking at one that said 0.5% alcohol and, and it was like non-alcoholic. I was like, okay. Uh, any less, so I got another one that said 0.05% alcohol and 0.05% is actually um, the adoption rate of 27,001 in the EEA 30 and the UK combined. Wow. Uh, See it going up in the UK because the um, I do a lot of work with health tech startups and the data protection toolkit has now got something in it that says that suppliers should have ISO 27001 or, or equivalent or something to that wording, which means suddenly a lot of these startups, which are really still very, very small in order to get their toolkit, are having to do 27001 as well. So I'm seeing more demand for that amongst smaller businesses than I was before. Yeah, certainly in those, so I went in the startups I was in as we were growing and we were going for larger and larger customers. I got the budget to do 27,001 when sales got fed up filling in a massive RFP. Um, another one was going into the NHS and that was a real driver as well. But it's still the actual, although it's gone from 2,400 certificates in the UK to 2,800 last year, you know, there's 2.78 million um, active enterprises, 
five million if you include all the sort of smaller businesses in there. So it's still at the UK, we're still at the 0.1 percent. Um, one of only three European countries with, with reaching 0.1. Germany's at 0.05 percent too. So it's, it, but it does it does sort of flow through in in, in best practices for sure. Um, in turn, just before we move on to the next bit, so. This is a really interesting bit about the size of companies. So how do you see the differences with a large company and a small company with that process we were talking about? So I tend to stick with the smaller companies for exactly that reason. I can't even begin to imagine trying to do a full data map on a large organization. I mean, I'm talking largely like a PLC or something like that. Um, even when I look at some of the solutions that are out there for large companies, I'm not gonna name any, I'm currently undergoing a process to set someone up on one of these systems, privacy systems. They are a very small company, less than 250 employees. And I have the expert qualification in doing this. So does my project manager. Between us, we're up to about 30 hours of work just to get their data map into the system. Yeah. You know, and it, how on earth is a large PLC doing this? I, I just can't imagine it. I really can't. I'd like to think maybe they already had a lot of it because, as everyone says, it's a evolution, not a revolution. Personally, I haven't just discovered that really. But, you no. know, I'd like to think that some of these big companies were already halfway there and maybe it's not so bad. But I, I just don't envy them at all. Yeah. David, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with Tash. It's really, really difficult. Um, you know, I've done stuff for some really, really big companies. I don't think, you know, after nine months, we even kind of scratched the surface in reality of kind of what was going on. You know, you, you can ask the questions, how many servers have you got? Well, we think we've got three and a half thousand servers. Great. Um, they all get patched and everything, all the usual security questions. Um, well, at least 750 are patched. Okay, which 750 are patched? We don't know, but we know we've done 750. So yeah. that, that's kind of where you, you get stuck because the volume of stuff and what goes on is, is just too complicated. And of course, the next problem you have is even when you have done, <laughs> I think we got to um, well over a million data points to, to kind of put the maps together. How do you manage that? How do you keep it going? Yeah. You know, you, you need an army of people to actually keep it updated, keep the changes going etc cetera, etc cetera. it is a phenomenal phenomenal task very very difficult is, i think this is also really a, a subject for another privacy kitchen but it's, it's about the the actual compliance of people because when the, what you're saying i totally agree when i'm looking to do sort of sales into large large enterprises you know, very few have, have their data map done their article 30s or the rope or whatever whatever we call it they're like you know, and these are the guys who will have 5,000 rows because all they've done is they've got each company to do something and then put it all into one big sheet. How do you manage a 5,000 row sheet? Um, uh, and we won't go into the NHS debacle of the, the, the track and trace Excel spreadsheet, but so it's, um, yeah, it's a tough one. But let's, let's um, on, while we're on, we're sort of, we've touched on the next bit, which I think is really, people are really interested in, which is the processing, what is a processing activity? How do you define what a row is? um so so tash could you sort of you know in in whatever we call it this this list of the um the, the inventory the personal data processing um what how do you determine what a row is what a processing activity is i tend to split it down by it's a processing activity for a unique group of data subjects for a unique purpose with one lawful basis that tends to be my guiding Thing. So if they start talking about direct marketing, I'm like, okay, well, the potentially there's direct marketing B2B. There's also direct marketing B2C. I would split those out, for example. So I do go, I, I mean, I'm constantly criticized on Slack and LinkedIn because I do go very, very granular because I think it's the only way that you can really identify the risks. There are some solutions out there which will actually then bucket stuff up, which can be useful, you know, depending on how you're then trying to display it. But I think you do have to go to that nth degree to know the business inside out. Um, which, like we said, it's not scalable. It's not scalable and it's not sustainable, but it works for the size of the companies that I work with. Absolutely. David, what do you, what, what, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I, think, I think one of the things is, you know, what, what actually is the kind of purpose of an Europa? And part of it has got to be is, can you deliver the data subject rights and can you manage data breach with that kind of information? And if, if there's too much in one line, it might be very, very difficult to come to any real conclusion. You know, as Ash said, you know, if you've got multiple legal bases, which is quite possible on one journey, 
um, how, how do you separate it? How do you make sure you can deliver data subject rights, um, let alone kind of, you know, any, any breach issues? So it, it's kind of breaking it down. So it, it does help you. But then you come across, you know, I've come across small companies and they've done amazingly well. You know, they've had thousands and thousands of record, you know, art ropers. Actually, it's unmanageable. You know, you, you're never going to find the right the right area. Yes, you've done it. You've done a good job, but actually, you can't do anything with it. it it's it's, it's very good point. It's got to be something that's usable, and I think that's where a lot of people are, are. They've done something in the past, and they're looking. They're look. They're coming back to renew it, and they're going. You know, GDPR is what two and a half years old now, and people are coming back and they're renewing their Article 30s or their ropers or what have you, their data, and they're going. Actually, this isn't. There's got to be a better way. And I think I totally agree on that. Uh, there's a there's a Belgian. It's quite hard to find specific on this, but there's a Belgian um, example of an Article 30 record that, and they, it separates out the if you have a different purpose or a different legal basis, that's their trigger to say right. So I totally agree that marketing B2B, marketing B2C, and whether that's emails or whether it's phone calls, because it also comes back to helping you. And we'll talk later about PECA and e-privacy about about complying with it. So I, I, I think that's a really good one. And, and I do think that you can still be strategic at that. So when you have marketing B2C, well, let's put it this way, trade shows is the example I always give. If you always treat trade shows in the same way and it's B2B, you can go marketing B2B trade shows handling leads. And as long as you deal with them in the same way and store it all in the same place, you can have one line. And I know some people have put every single trade show, they put a new line in their rope and that can just, you know, I think um, what David said is key. I'm seeing people starting to finally depend on the ropers because before it did feel like a bit of a tick box exercise because no one ever referred back to the roper. But I'm seeing, I don't know whether you're getting this as well, we are getting a ridiculous number of SARS coming in from a company called Privacy B, which yes. are basic fishing exercises. But, you know, at least when it comes in, we can say, okay, so this would have been this type of data subject. Therefore, if we look at the roper, this is where we've had the data these are the rights that apply you know this is what what we can do with them and it's a lot quicker so as much as i hate these fishing ex 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 can't get the words out as much as i hate them you know i am seeing that it's finally showing its worth on the rope because they know where to go and look you yeah. know so and i think that's your the benefit of the approach of going to that sort of you know different and it's the right way the different legal basis different purpose and, and the data subjects etc is it enables you, like you've both said, to react to a breach, to react to a data subject request, but also it leads to that different um, uh, benefits of, you know, reducing the amount of, you know, data deduplication. Those 3,000 servers, maybe they only needed 750 servers. So, you know, it, it flushes out a lot of that, that too. Um, so just before we move on um, to the next bit, this is a really great, great part. What's, what do you think then, I'll just throw it open to both of you. Um, we've talked about some numbers. What do you think is... A, like too low, someone's not had a proper go, a decent number of entries, a, an average number, a totally ridiculous high number, and how that reflects in different sizes of companies. I'll well, I think something, that. sorry, yeah, I think you got something is better than nothing, for sure. So I'm not sure there's kind of a, a minimum, but uh, you know, I think there should be at least a kind of high level rope because you can always kind of put that together reasonably quickly it may not be that useful but you've got something you've got an idea of what's yeah. going on otherwise you have absolutely no idea uh, i mean i think kind of as tash said you know I, i've been into companies and you go and talk to their accounts department and say you know the usual question do you have any personal data and they go no 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 we just deal with figures and whatever and then you do payroll yeah yeah we do payroll uh then you do kind of reconciliation with hr yeah yeah we do that yeah then you kind of do the tax, yeah, yeah. So after you've been through all that, actually you do deal with a lot of personal data. It's 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 really you know dragging that out, and that can take just take time because we we we've not had to do that. And I think the other downside is our IT systems have not been designed for data protection. We're still kind of using IT systems that were, although they're very slick and smooth, they're, they're kind of still designed on concepts in the 1970s, and really yeah. they haven't really jumped ahead and you know what do we need to do to manage kind of data going forward in the 21st century it's 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 way too difficult way too yeah, difficult. yeah very true and, and so, so tash what do you think on the sort of on i'll tell you, i'll throw out some numbers um so that i've sort of come across in different, <laughs> different see what you think so um i think if someone's got say five rows in their inventory they've, they've not done enough to sort of really think about the activities if they've got say 50 they're in the right sort of ballpark. 
if they've got say 200 that's potentially getting a bit high depending on size of business and how they're treating it but it's perfectly doable um, as you say about gets manageability is a different thing come across people with 2,000 5,000 rows which to me is just ridiculous it's just too many and they've all gone actually this is because we've amalgamated all this and it's duplication and it's so so what do you think to those sort of numbers so mine tend to be between I'd say 50 and 250 lines yeah. I my take on it is you have to have enough in there to be able to write an accurate privacy notice because you can't yeah. write a privacy just unless you know what you do for each type of data subject because all my privacy notices are written as the data subject so if this is your relationship with us this is what we hold this is why we hold it and i can't do that unless it's in the um the ropa already so there has to be enough in there to be able to write the privacy notice and that's always a good sanity check for me because if i'm halfway through writing it and realize i don't know the answer it's because it's not in my ropa and i need to go back and and so so I, as long as those two tally up it's generally going to be okay. It's good. I like that. It's good. It's a, it's a good rule of thumb as well. Fantastic. No, those numbers. So those numbers all seem absolutely um, spot on in what I'm hearing as well. So just on the on the timing, um, if we just move forward on to top tips and typical errors, we've sort of covered a fair few. But are there things in 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 sort of war stories? Maybe a couple of war stories would be good fun about some errors on the data map when someone thinks they've got it right and they haven't, or or something uh, a top tip. Uh, to head off those sort of errors before we move on to the wonderful topic of Brexit. My biggest error I see on them when I first come in and look at what they've got is where it says data controller and it's got the name of the department lead in there. I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not what data controller means at all. So that's yeah. the biggest error that I see. And the other one is, is I tend to think of it as being a little bit evolutionary you know i've got one client where i've been working with them for a year and we still haven't finished their their record of processing but we're working through it and we're getting there <laughs> you know so i i think we have to understand that this does have to run alongside business as usual you know yes. we haven't all got loads and loads of money to throw at this it's got to just be done alongside the business and it, within your own risk as well you know, your own risk criteria so they're my two yeah David? Yeah, I, I think the, the one that I come across is, you know, a data process map is not a business process map. Quite often they get mixed up and people go, oh, you know, when we've done it, we'll have a whole map of all our business processes. No, you won't. They don't really align. They might be similar. There might be overlap, but it's certainly not the same thing. And the other kind of favorite that I kind of see is that I see the record of processing, but it doesn't actually put where the data lives. So actually, you don't know where your data lives, you don't know whether it's cloud-based, you don't know whether it's in a system, but you've done a record of processing. You know, to some extent, that's a, not very much use other than the starting point for a lot more work. But yeah. uh, the, 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 the other side of the coin is, to do the level of detail, um, you know, you, where do you draw the line? Because it, it can take weeks and weeks, if not months and months, to kind of get this right. And by the time you've done it, it's probably changed anyway. Um, how do you get that balance right? There's a there's a question about <laughs> I'm putting the kettle on, um, that processing activities. Article 30 doesn't mention processing activities. It says, but so if I if I just go um, to Article 30 right now, I think one of the one of the bits that it's always have it on the screen <laughs> pretty well. Uh, so it's each controller and where applicable their representative shall maintain a record of processing activities. Uh, so it's in Article 31 and Article 32. So the record of processing activities under its control. But I think one of the one of the bits that's um, really interesting for me, what you said there is, and it goes back to the earlier conversation, is this is all part of business as usual. It's also part of all those other risk management programs. Even though the risk is about the individual's risk for GDPR, there's a risk for the entity in terms of fines. There's a risk of uh, lost business and 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 PR and what, this sort of thing. So it has to sit along. So obviously security is a, a big one next to it. Um, but you've mentioned other things like FCA or, or the NHS, or they've got a whole range of things to think, well, what, how do we do this? Um, what can be separate? What needs to be joined up and how do we join it up? And it is a, it is a, it is a big ask. It is a big ask on businesses. So um, What's let's just go in. Sorry. So in the ICO accountability framework that's just come out, there's a section mm -hmm. in there under the record of processing where it actually says that they expect the record of processing activities document to have links to 
the breach log, links to the legitimate interest assessment, all these different things they expect, but none of it is in here. None of, yeah. I mean, they're all separate, but it doesn't say that has to be part of your record of processing. So I think there are, to a certain extent, there is so many mixed messages of how things should be set out. Yeah. That I, I just don't envy anyone trying to do it as part of business as usual. It's like, what do I do? You know, which is why I was saying at the beginning, always just start with the basics. Yes. And then we can, we can fill it your, out. Your copy of the GDPR there in your hand. I know you have it always to hand, so it's uh, well thumbed. <laughs> <laughs> Very it's, well um, thumbed. It's a good, you know, I totally agree. Go to the source. You know, it's um, one of my one of my things on it is regulators have been massively overstepping the mark. I mean, the regulators have had a, their moments in the sun and some of them have got a little bit of sunstroke in certain areas. And you, so, for example, um, the EDPB, when they put out the territorial guidelines saying the Article 27 rep was the EU, EU rep was as liable as the processor or controller. Well, it's ridiculous. I mean, it, it, that was in early days. It was taken out. It's not in the law. There's a sentence in the recitals, which is not law. It's interpretive. But you can only find a control or a processor for certain things. And it was it, it was removed after the consultation period, thankfully, after the outcry. But I think there's a lot of regulators going, I want it to be like this. But actually, as, as you know, from the, my sort of GC bit, I would always say with regulators, you get the minimum of what it is that I have to give you that you're asking for. And then anything on top of that, I'm going to determine from our own purpose, is that a justifiable request? Um, are you entitled to that? Um, and, you know, it's, and so I can see why the ICO would like it all linked, but it's, it's, there's enough already for people to do. It's like, let's focus on, on yeah. that print. Absolutely. That actually matters to the data subject. Let's focus on that first, because that's ultimately that the data subjects at the heart of this not an excel sheet not a solution you know it's can we is that Christopher said can we do the rights of the data subject and that's what yep. the record of processing is all about it's knowing where stuff is and knowing which rights apply for each process yeah absolutely which talking of data subject rights they're about to to double and we were talking about this a bit earlier in in, in our in our pre-session it's um with brexit now we can open up brexit so um <laughs> What's Brexit? So from, yeah. from the date we'll take as the 1st of January uh, 2021, um, the UK GDPR will come in, the transition period will finish, unless we get an extension of the transition period. But the <laughs> 1st of Jan 2021, UK GDPR comes in, EU GDPR is, is obviously for the EEA 30, not, not for the UK, apart from legacy European data, and you can just unwrap it as far as you want to go. But on the terms of this, data map, the records of processing, this inventory. What are your thoughts on the on Brexit's impact in terms of do you have to, how far do you have to go back and redo everything? How far, is, is it a massive impact? Is it a small impact? Where do you see the key impact? Um, I think it shows the difference between having taken the time to do extra detail in the ROPA than not because you know, obviously when Schrems came in, it was really easy to say, okay, so where are all our processes outside the EEA? Which ones do we need to worry about? Now we're starting to go, okay, where are our processes who are based in the EU who we're going to have to get data back from? And you know what? That's not in my ROPA, you know, or something like that, because we didn't need to put it in the ROPA. So I've got it on some and I can, you know, if I've done my processor due diligence, I can get it from somewhere, but not necessarily in the ROPA. So I think that forward planning of the ones where we did put it in because we knew this was going to come, it's going to save so much time next year now when we have to go back and start looking at repapering. Um, yeah. So that, for me, is the big one in the ROPA. Yeah. David? Um, I think if your companies are effectively then kind of selling outside the UK, you've, there's a whole tranche of legislation you know distance selling um you know how is that going to affect uh, potential kind of vat issues if you're you're selling in europe you need to be registered with that in 28 yeah. different countries um representatives might need to kind of kick in um i don't know you know each case has to kind of be looked at in its, its own own area really um to me for example pick on estonia again um, and I'm being kind of a little bit loose with the figures here. I think they have a criteria that you need a DPO if you have over 10,000 records or 15,000 records. It's quite a low amount. In the UK, it's if you're a big 
as big as a social media company, you definitely need a, a DPO. Yeah. So you could be in the UK selling to Estonia and actually find you need a DPO, whereas you didn't before, to comply with local regulation. Um, so I think there, there's, there's, I don't know, you know, we don't know what's going to happen yet, but it could be, could be quite complex. And I don't think I'd kind of want to have to do that. Was it 27 European countries and what would the other six, Norway, Liechtenstein, uh, yeah, Switzerland, nice. all have yes. their own? That's one of the, the privacy kitchen yesterday on uh, the EU representative, and that video is coming out <laughs> since. So just in terms of date, this is the 16th of December. So when, uh, if anyone's watching the recording later, this is why we're talking about Brexit in this manner at this point. Um, so the 16th of December 2020, and the transition period finishes at the end of December. And we're talking, you know, EU representative, UK companies. We didn't care about the EU representative because we were in the EU and we were doing all of this. So that. You know, it won't even be a consider. Won't have been considered, and the, the 25 million active enterprises in Europe won't have thought about a UK one either. So that's something extra onto the the transfers bit. I think so transfers. To me, sorry. Again, sorry, Europa comes in again because you only need the EU rep if you don't already have a European <laughs> location or establishment, and you're. I'm going to get this right. You're not doing occasional transfers. Yeah. So you, it's only really, I mean, yes, someone in their gut knows roughly how much they're doing, but it's through the ROPA. You look at it and say, okay, so where where do we have non-UK data subjects? What is the processing we're doing? Is that occasional? Is that high risk? Therefore, yeah. we do or don't. So if you've documented it properly, it should be an easy decision to make. If you haven't documented it yet, then it's going to have to be, right, get back to the business. Let's try and work this out. And again, it's a little bit more work now, things we hadn't considered before. Add yeah, to that of companies who've set up as EU representatives and try to tell everybody in the world they need one, which is totally untrue, you know, and it, it, it's scaring companies to think that they have to have them when they don't. Yeah, well, I think there's a there's been, you know, GDPR has always been a bit of project fear in some ways, some people's marketing and, and um, you know, people like your good selves have always sort of not not done project fear which is fantastic but there's been a lot of people on project fear and selling it's been the wild west on gdpr and, and, and it's very hard to get people who really really get it and, and you can even see you know i mean it's difficult even privacy professionals on linkedin we have all these sort of discussions about whether someone's a controller or a processor or not it's one of the most fundamental things to the whole lot so how are people meant to do it so i do have a bit of sympathy or a lot of sympathy for, for businesses on this I think that, that that's a really interesting comment from you, Tash, about the data subjects as well and the, the rep, because on transfers, so I was sort of thinking more around the transfers bit, the SHREMS too, like do we know where those are? Now transfers is outside the UK, and if you're covered by the EU GDPR, it's transfers. So you've got two different geographic locations for transfers. You've then also got where the data subjects are themselves. So it's you know separate to transfers, that geographical footprint. Um, which may not well have been uh, captured in that initial data mapping. So no, that's that's a that's a fantastic uh, fantastic comment. So um, we're into the sort of the Q and A part here, and I'll just I'll just um, I'll just check on the the questions in here. That's why so you're looking for trying to just mention marketing and PECA and Brexit, because I so think I, it's been yeah. very overlooked. So and this, this is the one that's, that's been asked as well. So, so let's do that. So, I, we were talking. Do you want to lead us off? Yeah, sure. Because it's something we were talking about right before this. Because it is definitely something that's been overlooked. So, right now, if we um, are marketing to people in Europe, we have been able to pretty much slightly dodgy rely on the rules of PECA in the UK to say that we can use soft opt-in here. We can market B two B, and companies like Germany and Austria, I think it is, who are particularly strict. Uh, where they like double opt-in consent we've been able to sort of say Do you know what we're part of the eu we've implemented pecca therefore we're okay well when we brexit we're not going to, be able to do that anymore we're going to have to go with the local laws and i am starting to think how on earth do i know who is in my marketing database because that's not part of my ropa yeah. you know i just know that i do marketing for newsletters i do marketing for this i've done b2b marketing you know, but do, does that cross border? Where are those data subjects based? I probably don't even know right now. You know, if they've got a, a business domain that's .com, they could be anywhere. So yeah. this is something that we're all gonna have to look at. And I don't know that it's ever been part of anyone's rope to go down to that level of detail, but as 
we've added all this new complexity to our lives through Brexit, we're going to have to start adding complexity to make sure that we can adhere to the local rules, because my gut feel is that those various countries are going to come down hard on us in the UK because it serves us right. You know? So why wouldn't they? Um, and I think we, we could potentially be in for a bit of a pasting there, maybe. I think you're right. David, what, what, what do you think on that? Um, yeah, I, I think I think that sounds about right, really. I mean, I, I was amazed that we kind of got away with it so far, even kind of pre pre Brexit. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the cookie battles are kind of warming up. It was only October, wasn't it, where the Canal and uh, Island have kind of said, you know, the grace period's over. We're going to start enforcing, you know, good cookie behaviour. Uh, we see a lot of it in Europe, very little in the UK. So does that mean that? you know, companies trading abroad may get hit more on the, the cookies component a lot more. I think yeah, Denmark's got, what, over 200 cases in the pipeline? When it was PECA and the old directive, it, we could sort of get away with the PECA jurisdiction aspect. Uh, but now that the directive's been replaced by GDPR, that's got a bit washier. And now that we're going to be out of out of Europe at the end of the transition period, you know, national regulators are want, to, want to protect their own their own citizens. I mean, France's 7th of December came out with two big enforcements of Google and Amazon. I think definitely you'll put, I agree with you that national regulators are going to take this on and, and, and we've made our own bed on that on that side. So it'll be a, that'll be a very interesting bit. Um, and in, in terms of in terms of the the e-privacy director, seeing as we're on that, I think it's a nice one about how your data map, a lot of people, you know, we all talk about GDPR and I always give the example of an elephant that GDPR is most of the elephant of data protection law and like one big back leg is the e-privacy directive and the trunk is the national law. Uh, but, you know, so but a lot of people just focus on the GDPR and, and, and these data maps um, do need to be broader, uh, even within the privacy area. So that's a really good, a really good point. So we're coming up to, to, to the 12 to 12, 15. So I'd just like to say thank you very much indeed, um, both to Tash and David. This has been a really um, really fun uh, rapid run through data protection we covered so much ground uh, and this this will be up on the privacy kitchen channel um everybody please share it and they can come back and look at it later on as well and we'll see what happens after 31st december we'll find out soon and thank you very much guys <laughs> thanks yeah, thanks, guys. thanks tash bye cheers